Pearson, that first song you played, Jesus Loves Me, that really is true. He loves you a whole bunch. David reminded us in the communion thoughts uh, about new beginnings. You know, it really is true that uh, because of what Jesus did on Friday of this week as we celebrate what he did at that one point in history and because of his resurrection, that for those who are his, you can lay your head on a pillow every night and wake up in the morning with a new beginning. Clean, white, pure, washed clean from your sin. New beginnings. Jesus offers them moment by moment. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Father, for the completed work of Jesus. We celebrate this week what he did, but it is just that. It's a celebration. It's not any kind of a reenactment because certainly what he did was a one time for all of history for all of eternity because what he accomplished there through his suffering, through his death, through his resurrection, never could be and would never need to be repeated. Father, may we uh, faithfully and lovingly proclaim in Jesus new beginnings, cleansing, forgiveness, hope. May we revel in Jesus and what he did. I thank you for your word as it uh, reveals him to us. Would you speak in these moments? Would you anoint and empower your word? And may it go forth in the power of your spirit and Accomplish what you intend. In the blessed name of Jesus we pray. Amen. It was, a, it was a night like no other in all of human history. It had all begun uh, as uh, they celebrated that moment to which for centuries have been the most meaningful, the most intimate moment for every Jewish family uh, in their entire year, and that is the Passover celebration. In that most intimate moment, uh, those uh, 12 men at that uh, meal around that table were shocked. Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. Betray? Most of them at that table could not even imagine betraying this one whom they had been with for three and a half years. But then, uh, all too soon, the scene changed and the intimate meal uh, shared around the table all of a sudden became that quiet, lonely garden just outside the city. And Jesus, face to the ground, agonizing so deeply in conversation with his Father that being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The stillness of the garden was broken by the sound of voices. They got closer and closer, 
And there in the darkness the crowd of men appeared. The torches they carried uh, made shadows in the darkness. And out of the shadows stepped Jesus to face the mob. The events that uh, took place were almost a blur. Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. And then the kiss. The kiss. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. The arrest, the high priest's house, the trial, the predetermined verdict, the lies, the false testimony. He has spoken blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And the mocking, the insults, the cruelty, the beatings. <coughs> they spit in his face. They struck him with their fists. They slapped him. Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? The guards took him and beat him. Then to Pilate, as the first traces of dawn illumined the eastern sky, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say. I find no basis for a charge against this man. He has done nothing to deserve death. What shall I do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? All the louder, crucify him. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The crown of thorns, the weight of the cross, the place of the skull, Golgotha, and the nails, the agonizing nails. And all four evangelists, all four gospel accounts, simply say, they crucified him. And there he hung, nailed on that rough wooden cross beam, under the blazing 9 a.m. Judean sun, suspended between heaven and earth. Jesus would hang there on that cross for six hours. At 3 p.m. he would breathe his last. But during those six agonizing hours, Jesus would speak no less than seven times. In one of the most moving and the most thought-provoking, and I would suggest to you most challenging statements in all of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul declares in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Did you catch what Paul said? Becoming like him in his death. What was he like in his death? 
I would suggest to you that we can learn a great deal about the Lord Jesus in his death by considering those last seven declarations that sprung from his lips as he hung there on the cross. I'd like to take these few minutes that we have and briefly consider the seven words that the Savior uttered from the cross. No one gospel writer records all seven. And the exact sequence of a couple of those events uh, may be uncertain. But the actuality of all seven statements, there's nothing uncertain about that. Jesus' first statement from the cross is found in uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. When we read, uh, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. <coughs> During Jesus' three and a half year ministry, uh, he repeatedly instructed his followers, if you want to experience God's forgiveness, uh, then you must yourself forgive. Here, as the nails were being driven in the most excruciating agony, as they were being driven through his hands and his feet, he did not respond with anger. He did not respond with screams for mercy. He did not respond with hatred. Those would have been entirely normal for anyone having nails driven through his flesh. But instead, Jesus' response was to implore his Father to forgive the very ones who were ridiculing him, who were mocking him, who were driving the nails through him, the very ones who had lied about him. Jesus said, because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know, dear Father, that they are crucifying the very Son of God come in human flesh. They are killing the very one, the only one, who can give them life and hope. When I hear Jesus beseeching his Father to forgive those who were nailing him there, I'm forced to ask, and maybe you are too, what offense is so great that I am unwilling to forgive? Jesus' second statement from the cross is found in the... Uh, 19th chapter of the Gospel of John. There we read in uh, verses 25 through 27 these words, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. I can't imagine how horribly painful those moments were for the mother of Jesus. I can't imagine the heart-wrenching agony that she was experiencing as she stood there at the foot of that cross and saw her son agonizing. And there was absolutely nothing that she could do except to suffer.
be right along with him. Who would care for her in the days ahead? Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. Jesus was the oldest son. In all likelihood, Mary's husband Joseph was no longer living. It was Jesus' responsibility as the oldest son to provide for his mother. And so in the midst of his own agony, Jesus, because of his concern for his mother, made provision for her future. He made certain that his mother would be cared for by the Apostle John. There was not merely one cross on Golgotha that day. There were three. Jesus uh, was in the center cross, was on the center cross. There was a thief and a robber, one on one side and one on the other, on their own individual crosses. The one thief uh, scornfully rebuked Jesus uh, from the cross. As we read, uh, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. The other, whose heart was touched uh, by uh, his own personal sin and uh, his own eternal lostness as he faced death in the face, whose heart was touched by the obvious difference uh, between himself and his companion and this man on the center cross, there was something different. As that thief hung there for those hours, the thoughts began to run through his mind. Could this be? Could he really be? And then his desperate plea, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus' third statement from the cross, I tell you the truth, today, you will be with me in paradise. Salvation, Jesus offered it freely. That thief didn't deserve it. For him, salvation was totally undeserved. But the reality is that salvation is totally undeserved for every single person, every one of us. But Jesus offered that undeserved salvation. He was the only one. He was the only one who could give it, who could offer it. He was the, on, the one and only Savior. And he told that thief there that salvation wasn't just some distant hope on the horizon but that salvation would be reality for even that thief on that very day. Jesus' fourth statement from the cross is possibly the most problematic of all seven of his statements. It's recorded both by Matthew and by Mark. We read in Mark chapter 15, verse 34, And at the ninth hour Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? objections to uh, what that statement means uh, range like these. Uh, God would never forsake His own Son. 
Jesus merely felt alone. He merely felt abandoned. But he was really mistaken when he cried those words. Actually, the words that Jesus spoke were a quotation from the 22nd Psalm, the first verse. The agonizing, the agonized cry of David, the psalmist. But they were now on Jesus' lips. I would suggest to you those uh, reasons for uh, dismissing the reality of Jesus being forsaken by God by trying to uh, write it off as mistaken reality of Jesus or uh, God would never forsake. Uh, those uh, attempts are totally unsatisfying when we look at the text. Because the truth is that uh, if God is totally holy, pure and righteous, if God is totally separated from sin, and the scripture repeatedly declares that all of those are reality. And if Jesus there on the cross literally became sin, as is clearly stated in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where we read, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. If God is holy and pure, and if Jesus on that cross literally became sin, then in some incomprehensible way, in those moments there on the cross, as the old gospel preachers used to say, God turned his face away from his own son. It's almost too horrible to imagine that God would ever do such thing. And yet, if nothing else, that fourth statement from the lips of Jesus on the cross, that agonized cry, why, my God, have you forsaken me, ought to uh, deeply convict every one of us of the horribleness, of the unspeakable detestableness of sin, even of my sin and yours. The fifth statement uh, of our Lord from the cross is recorded in uh, John chapter 19, verse uh, 28, this time. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Thirsty. You wouldn't think that the Son of God would uh, deal with something like that. But that fifth statement from the lips of our Lord points up as clearly as anything else His total, His complete association with us as human beings. In that association, he was not immune to what every other person would uh, suffer there on that cross. Not only was he not immune to the pain, but he was not immune to the parched throat there in that Judean sun after those six hours. <coughs> and so he uh, asked, for something to wet his parched throat. I think there was a very uh, 
practical reason that he did so. Not just that he was human and that his throat was dry, but he did so in anticipation of what he would next utter. Indeed, that sixth <coughs> statement from the cross. That's recorded in, uh, also in uh, John chapter 19. As we read in uh, verses 29 and 30, a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I would suggest to you that uh, when the Lord spoke those six, that sixth word from the cross, it was uh, by no means a whisper. It was, uh, I would suggest to you, not even spoken in a normal tone of voice. In fact, Luke tells us that he spoke with a loud voice. One gospel uh, student has said that it was almost a shout. It was almost a roar. A shout of victory is what it was. Victory because God's eternal plan <laughs> for redeeming mankind, God's eternal plan for providing forgiveness from sin's penalty was now paid in full. It is finished. And finally, the words that God spoke all the way back in the third chapter of Genesis, where he said to the servant, you indeed will bruise the heel of the woman's offspring, but her offspring will crush your head, serpent. Those words are now completed, now fulfilled, now accomplished, and Jesus could shout, It is finished. The seventh and final words from our Lord's lips, they're on that cross before he died, were uh, in contrast to the shout of victory, where I would suggest to you a uh, gentle, confident statement, maybe almost a whisper as he is speaking to his own father. We find those words in the uh, 46th verse of uh, Luke chapter 23 when we read Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Since penalty, since punishment had been paid, while he had been forsaken and abandoned, he was now victorious. And with a confident assurance, in his intimate relationship with his Father, Jesus could say, I commit my spirit to you, Father. And then John says, he gave up his spirit. And so was fulfilled the words that Jesus had spoken months earlier. When we read uh, that uh, in John chapter 10, beginning with verse 17, Jesus speaking, he says, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, 
but I lay it down of my own accord. Luke and John are both quick to make clear. The soldiers didn't take Jesus' life by crucifixion. Pilate did not put him to death. But instead, Jesus laid down his life. And when it was the moment of completion, he gave up his spirit. <coughs> So what do we do with this uh, glimpse of Jesus in those six hours on the cross? At the very least, may I suggest to you that uh, we be extremely careful that we never think casually or lightly of what Jesus did. While he was the Son of God, while he would return to his Father, nonetheless, he suffered unimaginable agony. Now, I know that every person who was ever nailed to a cross in the first century suffered unthinkable agony, but for Jesus, his agony was unique. Because for all or much of that six hours on the cross, he literally experienced the wrath of God poured out on sin as he hung there, having become sin. Jesus' agony on the cross was unimaginably more than any other person ever could be because his alone suffering was paying the penalty for sin. May we never think lightly of the cross. What are we to do with these words? Uh, may we never cease to sing his praises for his sin-bearing death. May we never be ashamed of our Lord and the cross. May we echo the words of Romans chapter 1, for I am not ashamed of the good news of the death of Jesus, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. What are we to do? May this glimpse of the cross cause us to uh, hate our own sin and at the same time to rest in the calm assurance that Jesus, through his completed work on the cross, has paid for our sin. And may we be eager to share with others that those uh, who leave this life committed to Jesus will experience heaven, the presence of the Lord, the presence of the Father from that moment and forever. Certainly that promise is... Uh, reserved for those who have committed themselves to Jesus. There were two thieves crucified that day. Only one of those thieves was granted the assurance of being with Jesus. It requires a faith commitment. Putting your faith, trust in Jesus repenting of sin, confessing his name, being buried with him in the waters of baptism. As I look around, uh, I imagine that uh, all of us here have uh, taken that step, have made that commitment. 
but I also imagine that we know of others who have not. May the message of our lips, the testimony of our lives be, God loves you, and he offers you hope in Jesus and the cross as we celebrate this Easter week. If God is dealing with your heart, our hymn of decision is number 330, Only Trust Him. If God is somehow uh, leading you to some kind of a decision that demands a public response, would you do so as we stand and sing number 330?